Okay, we're going to start off, um, you know, in explaining, admittedly, more extemporaneously than I had planned, kind of the plan of camp last night. Um, we do a series of topic lectures here during week one to try and get some background knowledge that is important for everybody to know for the topic. So this is the type of thing where if everybody in the camp understands it, it will help every lab in the camp, you know, work on the affirmative and negative arguments that they start on uh, this week. And in particular, I think for this topic, you know, one of the things to consider, especially those of you who haven't been uh, to any part of camp yet this summer, this is an economics focused topic. And we haven't had a lot of those in either high school or college debate in any recent memory. And so there are a lot of building blocks that are pretty important for understanding some of the key aspects of the, you know, economic policies that you're going to be researching. And in particular, it can be very confusing to read about them because many of them are kind of on the unorthodox side of existing policy choices in the United States. Social security, not so much, but job guarantee, universal income, these are economic ideas that in the US context in particular are somewhat unorthodox. So you, if, you know, if you're like me, you might end up in a situation where you're reading a lot of the unorthodox economic policies and theories before you really have an understanding of the orthodox ones, okay? Also known as the nay. Um, that can be very difficult to do if you don't have some of the building blocks and vocabulary for understanding that reading. It's a complicated set of material. So we've decided to start with a topic lecture that is about some of those, you know, both the orthodox and heterodox approaches to economics and how those intersect with a number of the policies that you'll be researching. We are very fortunate to have a guest speaker. He'll, he'll, he'll be here for parts of camp and, and you'll, you'll see him as a judge. You'll, you'll hear from him maybe in some electives. But um, in particular, giving this topic lecture, I, I feel very privileged to have Chris Callahan here. Chris was a debater at Northwestern, extremely successful, um, and one of the best researchers in debate that I've ever encountered. He's helped out the Dartmouth team for the past few years. and. If anybody needs to find a card on something, no matter how obscure, in about 20 minutes, uh, Chris is your guy. <laughs> and that's an impressive set of skills to watch. It also happens to uh, overlap or you know, be in addition to the fact that he is an extremely skilled scientific researcher. He deals with uh, environmental economics. He's a climate modeler. Um, he has been published in a, a number of major newspapers in the past year, um, detailing a number of findings about the historical responsibility of specific countries and companies for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It's pioneering work. That's the reason that it's showing up in major journalistic publications, what the Post, the Guardian. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it's not every day that I wake up and read uh, uh, somebody getting quoted uh, in, the, in the Washington Post who I work with regularly. It's pretty special. It's a cool occasion for us and very honor, uh, you know, much of an honor to Chris. It's also been published in Nature, if I remember, no, uh, Nature Climate Change? Yes. Nature Climate Change. <laughs> Eh, still, still, big, big, big stuff. Okay, he's a, a recently minted PhD from Dartmouth, and that means that you all have to address him as Dr. Callahan, but I can just call him Chris. I know he'll really love that. Um, the more that you treat him with, uh, you know, August honors and and uh, all the professional respect that he deserves. But we're lucky to hear from him this morning. I hope that you pay rapt attention to the things that he has to say. Um, one last thing that I will mention before he starts that just, I, you know, to reemphasize one little thing from last night, since we didn't really talk about some of the classroom usage stuff, technically Dartmouth classes do not allow food and beverages. Okay. Now I know like, okay, Turner's, <laughs> Turner's got his tea. This is ubiquitous. You'll see this basically every morning. Uh, many of you have water bottles, snacks, etc. We will be okay on that as long as we are very studious about cleaning up after ourselves. Okay, like finding your, your smoothie cup and like crap like that on the floor after this uh, lecture, not okay. So please make sure that in order for us to retain usage of the rooms as well as, um, you know, just making sure that we're not creating extra work for the custodial staff, we need to make sure in particular for food and beverages that we're taking all that stuff with us. Without further ado, the fun part of the morning, we'll hear from Chris Callahan. Cool. Well, thank you, Turner. Um, I'm happy to be here. I am going to go for about two hours, so this is a long one. We'll take a break in the middle, so you don't have to let me talk for two hours straight. But I think we're going to go until about 11:30. Uh, you'll have about half an hour of like lab and generic signups and stuff like that at about 11:30, uh, and then lunch after that. But this is going to be most of the morning, so 
a lot. Uh, I am going to structure this lecture by starting with some basic definitions. We're going to talk about that, which I hope you all have seen in one form or another by now. Um, forgive my handwriting. Um, I'm going to talk about basically a set of economic concepts and areas that I think sort of unify the debates on this topic. I'm not going to talk a lot about the specifics of the policies. We'll do some definitions to talk about the basis of the policies, but then we're going to zoom out a little bit and talk about what we talk about when we talk about redistribution and the economics of redistribution and things like that. Um, the unifying theme of a lot of the policies we're going to be talking about and the, the sort of theme of this topic is that we often have to protect people from the market, right? The free market system doesn't always work, doesn't always provide people with the well-being or the income or the security that they need. And so at times, the federal government or other governments have to step in and provide assistance or relief to people to protect them from the vagaries of the market. The policy options in this topic are all defined by the use of federal economic policy to increase people's economic well-being and compensate for the failure of the market to provide that well-being. I think right now is a really good time to be debating this. We are at, a, uh, at an interesting p point in sort of economic policy and economic debates. Um, there has been quite a bit of economic upheaval over the last 15 years or so, starting with the 2008 recession, moving into the sort of Obama era. There was a very incomplete recovery from the recession. There was a period that some people have called secular stagnation, which we'll talk about uh, in a little more detail. Then there was Trump. There was the debates over the Green New Deal. There was COVID. There was the sort of what you might call a new era of economic policy under Biden that's actively debated. All of the, this debate is characterized by a neoliberal, what I would call a neoliberal consensus being contested both from the right wing and from the left wing by an emerging progressive consensus defined by expansionary fiscal policy, words we'll define, and skepticism of some of the classic philosophical approaches to economic policy. So this is a really exciting time to be thinking about what it means to adopt a very aggressive federal you know, government approach to social security and economic well-being. The rise of technology and automation and AI and things like that also mean that we have to understand how the labor market and employment and social welfare are all affected by markets and federal economic policy. So I would argue that this is a really, really good time to be thinking about this topic in, in detail and about the sort of contestation of economic ideas more broadly. Making sense to folks? All right, uh, let's talk about this for a moment just to kind of level set. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about a lot of this, but like, let's start with this. What's that? Fiscal redistribution, someone define it, yes. Robin Hood, taking money from the rich, giving it to the poor. Yep, I think that's what most of us think about when we see this phrase. Are there other things it could mean? Just giving money would not necessarily take it away. Sure. Uh, I, I would argue giving money in a way that affects the overall yeah. income distribution, but it doesn't necessarily mean taking, it might just mean giving in a targeted fashion. Yep. Preservation of the less fortunate. Preservation of the less fortunate, sure. It could, in theory, mean any form of redistribution, including taking from the poor and giving to the rich. Reverse Robin Hood, right? Take from the poor, give to the rich. You never know. There are some sickos out there. <laughs> a little bit, but not quite. Uh, one other thing I'm thinking about that is maybe a little more subtle. Anyone else have ideas about redistribution? Yes. Right, so taxing the rich more, and maybe that doesn't even mean giving to the poor, right? So you could imagine redistribution just involving spending in a targeted way without any taxation, or taxation in a targeted way without any spending. We'll talk about some of those in more detail as well. The other thing I would say is there's potential for, uh, you could imagine give, taking from one state and giving to another state, or taking from one municipal government and giving to another. So redistributing just meaning between, like, between governments or between agents rather than sort of like rich poor. But again, taking for the rich, giving to the poor is the basic structure of this topic, obviously. That's mostly what we're going to talk about today. Just be aware that there's other ideas here as well. Um, we said taxes. I also wanted to find the word transfers. So taxes and transfers are the two things we've talked about, right? Taxing is taking money from somebody. Transfers is giving money to somebody. You'll often hear redistribution be de defined 
as taxing and transferring, or taxes and transfers, or one of the other. OK, that's very redistribution. Job guarantee, that's JG here, federal job guarantee. Anyone who wants a job can get a job. Anyone who wants a job can get a job. That's all I got. Anyone else? That's what it is. Yep. Well, specifically the federal government providing that job. Potentially. Um, there's debate over that. There's some folks who think that the federal government should facilitate nonprofits providing people jobs or state governments, things like that. But yeah, federal job guarantee, meaning the federal government is the one kind of doing this policy independent of who kind of implements it. Yeah. Uh, what kind of jobs? Unspecified. Yes, but like substantively, what is the likely type of job that would be talked about here? Yep, we got to build a lot of solar panels. We got to build a lot of wind farms. We got to retrofit a lot of buildings, um, bridges, roads, others. It is true that this is unspecified. So, like, for like topicality reasons, this doesn't matter. But like, what you're actually going to be debating about here and then here. Well, if you read True Staff, degrowth oriented jobs. Like what? It's uh, a really good question. Uh, yes. <laughs> I feel like these jobs wouldn't necessarily have any like primitive educational requirements as far as like. Kind of sort of sure, building a bridge, building a road. Sorry? Yep, absolutely. Whichever job the two AC wants to specify. In reality, that's how it's actually going to go, right? Uh, I would also uh, note that one of the biggest sectors that is expanding at the moment that will need more jobs is caregiving. So I would be, I would expect it to be very likely that people will read apps to give a job guarantee for like home health aides or nursing, nursing. Um, infrastructure and public works, we sort of said, this is like work progress administration, new deal type stuff. Um, art, my guess is that there are people who, and I know that, I mean, I know, I know that there are people who suggest job guarantee would include art, maybe not just art, but like, Again, this is sort of like New Deal, like big murals and big statues and stuff, kind of like very sort of like um, public ethos, works progress administration, art deco type stuff. Any of these. Again, unspecified in, in, in here, but the people that suggest this are thinking about infrastructure, public goods, public works, green, you know, green jobs, caregiving, that kind of thing. Okay. Social security. You know the drill by now, not you. Like a program that like provides retirement plans, and I think also step in for like health reasons. Retirement plans, yes. Um, health, I want to separate out, but we'll come back to health benefits in a second. Yes. I think it's like it's like a portion of your income that's like filtered away into like a retirement fund, so that when you retire, you like get that in like loans or whatever. Yep. Yes. Yes. So over the course of your working life, you pay something called a payroll tax. It's part of your income. It goes to Social Security. You get that money at what age? 65. 65. Starting at age 65, you get uh, monthly payments from the federal government, if, if you would like them. Yeah. There you go. Minors whose parents have passed away. The pension is also available to people with disabilities, and the Social Security Administration is also in charge of welfare programs such as CAM. Yes, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so, like, capital S, capital S, Social Security, in most discourse usually refers to, like, the retirement benefits part of this, right? Age 65. There's other stuff, obviously. Um, yes? Could it also be, like, an expansion of any policy under the Social Security Agency? Yeah. Okay. So, let's sort of disaggregate two things here. So, expanding Social Security if you talk to like your parents, what they will likely say, if you said, what would it mean to expand social security? They will likely say lowering the retirement age. That's like the classic proposal. It's like you make it 60 or 55 so you can get social security earlier. But the social security administration and the social security act include other things. So a couple, there's two things that haven't been said by name so far. They would know what I'm thinking about. Uh, healthcare, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, 
Which one is which? What is Medicare? Medicare. Not you. What's up? Either one. Not quite. That's Medicare Part D. <laughs> yeah. Medicare is for old people. Medicaid is for um, people who can't afford public services. Medicare is for old people. Medicare is like the health version of Social Security. Medicaid is for people who are low income and can't afford health insurance. In basic, basic terms. I want to move on because like we have lots of other stuff to talk about, but like that's Social Security, right? Retirement benefits, Medicare, Medicaid, like maybe some other stuff um, around the edges. Basic income. This is the easiest one. Yeah. Yeah, you get money. Government gives you money. Uh, what word is missing from the topic? Universal. Universal. <laughs> um, not missing in a bad way, but just conspicuously not there is the word universal. So it doesn't have to be universal. But it's money, right? It's unconditional money. It's not unemployment insurance. It's not child tax credit. It's cash. It's like this, you know, the stimulus during COVID. Did anyone of you get the stimulus payments? I don't know if you're too young for that, maybe. No, I didn't. You got them? You didn't get them. Okay. I think that was the age requirement. Yeah. yeah. I got them. It was cool. Um, <laughs> I'm old. Um, all right. So that's the topic. Any questions about just like basic topic stuff? There's like lots of other stuff here. I didn't talk about the verbs. I didn't talk about substantially, but that'll be all later in lab. All right. So the whole rest of the lecture, I'm going to group into basically three topics. That's going to zoom out a little bit and talk about like why we are talking about this. First section is the economics of redistribution and inequality. So like what we mean when we say redistribution from an economic perspective. Second section is the economics of deficit spending and debt. So we're going to talk about like what it means for the federal government to spend money. And then the last section is inflation and labor markets. So we're going to learn a little bit about inflation. All right. First section, redistribution and inequality. Um, what are we looking at when we think about the status quo and inequality? Um, United States is a fairly unequal place. It's more unequal than a lot of other similar countries. Uh, income growth over the last several decades has primarily gone to the wealthiest household, households. The share of wealth held by the top 10% house, households is about 70%. Um, inequality has been slightly declining since the Great Recession. So there was a sort of explosion in inequality from the 1970s to, uh, and 1980s to, to the Great Recession. It's kind of plateaued in terms of the income distribution, maybe decreased a little bit, but we are still at relatively high levels of inequality relative to the sort of post-war 1940s to 1970s, you might call the like golden age of economic prosperity for white people. Um, part of this is wage stagnation. So wages over the last several decades have gone up. Right? People make more now than they did before. Anyone know what they have not gone up as fast as? Inflation, yes, but not what I'm looking for. Cost of living, yes, not what I'm looking for. Productivity. So you will likely see some version of this graph in various cards you're cutting or whatever. If you've already seen this, I apologize, but not that much. Um, we have like this, this is like 1970 here, and you have like this, right? And this is productivity, and that's wages. Productivity, can someone define that for me? How much stuff you get done? Yeah, basically. Like economy-wide income? Economy-wide income, not quite. Productivity is one thing that determines economy-wide income. How much income the economy generates from like labor? Labor and the word is capital. You don't have to actually know that. The point is, if if you're a person and you're standing at a machine and you spend an hour at that machine making stuff, the amount you get, like per input, is productivity. Right? So it's not total output. It's like output per input. So productivity has gone up, right? Like we are more skilled across the economy than we were before. We're better at using our machines. We have better machines than 30 years ago. So productivity has gone up. Even, like even if you would hold the number of workers and the number of machines constant, right? Same number of workers, same number of machines. A given worker is better at using that machine than they used to be. 
but wages have not kept pace with that, right? So workers are not making more like at pace with the increase in productivity. There's a lot of reasons for this, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this is another sort of defining characteristic of inequality at present. It's one of the explanations that people give that you'll hear a lot about. Anyone know what I mean when I say secular stagnation? I said this word earlier, phrase earlier. Let's break it up. What does secular mean? This is a, this is the harder one. All the way back. Yes, but not in this context. It is true that secular means non-religious. In an economic sense, what does it mean? Not that's sectoral. Maybe I should write this down. I'll just tell you. I'm not going to make you keep guessing. Uh, let's just write here. Secular means long term. So this is contrasted with cyclical. So we have something we call the business cycle, which is just sort of like the natural ups and downs in the economy. Secular is sort of long term, long term trend, not the sort of year to year details. Stagnation, I don't know, you probably know what that means, right? It's like things are kind of flat. The phrase secular stagnation in particular refers to periods of long term low demand. So people aren't spending as much. People and businesses are saving and not spending on goods and services. Interest rates are very low. We'll talk about interest rates more in a bit. You probably have heard that the Fed just recently raised interest rates. So this period was popularized by somebody in the 80s, but more recently by a guy named Larry Summers. He was the chair of Obama's, or he was a member of Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, Harvard professor, president of Harvard. His thesis was the post Great Recession periods, like 2010 to I would say about 2020, was this period of low demand, low interest rates, people not spending money, even though the Fed was trying to reduce interest rates to make people spend money and buy things and invest, mm -hmm. but they weren't doing it. So it was this sort of, you've heard the phrase in debate probably slow growth, right? Everyone talks about slow growth in their impact cards. This is a sort of key characteristic of slow growth is this sort of long term, people aren't spending, people are saving more than they're spending, businesses are saving more than they're spending, interest rates cannot be lowered to produce more spending. We'll talk about interest rates in a bit. But that's another sort of recent characteristic of the economy that people talk about as producing inequality or sort of flat wages and things like that. Does that make sense to folks? Maybe. This is like a little bit less important. All this intensifies when you're considering like race and gender, right? There's a gender wage gap. People who are not men make like 77 cents on the dollar relative to men. Um, the racial income gap is not that large. Like people, like black people make nearly as much as white people, but the racial wealth gap is huge. So home ownership and sort of like, gen you know, generational wealth, right? Houses that are passed down family to family, assets like art, Stuff like that, right? Wealth is, let's do a brief sidebar. What's income? Money coming in. Money coming in. What's wealth? Money, money you store. Total amount of assets, money you store, money you have. Yeah, all basically right. Right? Income is like yearly that you get. Wealth is like the full stock that you have. Critically, wealth includes things that are not like your paycheck in the bank, right? Wealth, what's the, the biggest thing that accounts for wealth amongst the most Americans? Property, real estate, it's your house, right? The reason that most people, but mostly white people, have wealth and generational wealth is because they own a home or they have a mortgage on a home. They have a claim on equity on a home. Um, but there's a long history of racial discrimination in home ownership and things like that that has produced a large racial wealth gap independent of any income gaps. So why is this? Why do we have inequality? Um, I have some ideas, but I would like to hear yours. Why, why is this, or more generally, why do people at the top of the distribution make a lot more? Yeah? I think it's based on um, the productivity and like different central areas of living, but kind of like the basic income in different kind of areas. So it's spatial. Yes, yeah, right? spatial or environmental in like its own. So, but I guess what you're saying is like it's not just two people in the same place, one making a lot more than the other. It's right. that some places are much more productive and make right. a lot more and a lot richer than other places. That is absolutely true. Donald Trump won 
80% of the land in the United States in 2016. No, 2020. Right, 80% of the land area in the United States was a vote that went to Donald Trump, was like a district that voted for Donald Trump. Joe Biden won 70% of the economic activity in the United States. Cities and very productive areas and things like that. Yes? Are there anything else? Why do we have inequality? What, or, or why do we have a recent rise in inequality? Blue shirt. Um, Sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, sorry. Um, it's because one reason might be that capitalism as a system encourages, because of the profit motive, to leverage companies for people who want to keep the wages low, as whether productivity increases or not, to make more money. You don't want to pay your workers. Why don't those workers just get another job? Uh, because of significant inequality, they might not actually be able to. Like what? Uh, well, moving's expensive and you have to move. Um, if you don't have yep. to move, it might be that no other companies are paying any better than they are, because they're also trying to lower their wages. Sure. We have, have you all heard the phrase monopsony power? Why not? Maybe sometimes people are nodding. We don't have that many, in a lot of places, you don't have that many employers, right? If you're, if you live like around here, like I live in Lebanon, which is a town in New Hampshire, like next to Hanover, there's like some non-zero chance you work at the hospital because it's just an a massive employer, or Dartmouth actually, right? Dartmouth and the hospital associated with Dartmouth is like a major employer in this area. It's not easy to get another job. If you get fired from the hospital, you can't just go work at another hospital. There's not one around here. Great. Right. You have historical inequalities that are producing, you know, um, disparities. Those disparities reproduce themselves because you can't afford college or things like that. Yep. Can't afford college. Can't afford whatever. Can't afford a master's degree. Yep. The recessions 2008 and 2020 have made it harder to like, you know, keep a good job, afford rent, and create that sort of generational wealth, upward mobility by like owning a house, having a mortgage. Yeah, so COVID is a little bit, is an interesting case. We can maybe talk about it. The Great Recession definitely did that, right? Like you had a, a, a very long and incomplete recovery after the Great Recession that people did not recover back to where they were before. Let's talk about some of the specific things. Um, social spending and welfare have been reduced in their outlays. So after welfare reform in the 1990s, for example, you have a lot more restrictions on who can get welfare like temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, unemployment insurance, the child tax credit just expired, for example, things like that. So the federal government in places has cut the kind of welfare and social spending that might reduce inequality. What have taxes on the wealthy done? Gone down, or at least they haven't gone up that much. Same with corporations. Um, anyone know what capital gains are? Taxes on property? Not quite. Yes, so if I have stock in a company, that stock might pay dividends, right? You get some payment out of that stock on a regular basis, potentially. That is not taxed to the degree that it maybe should. And a lot of rich people have their money in investments, right? They have money in the stock market or other financial instruments. You can make income from those financial instruments that are not taxed at the degree that other income is. Have you all heard that Warren Buffett is like taxed less than his secretary or whatever? Right? You know who Warren Buffett is? Very rich guy, Berkshire Hathaway real estate guy. His thing, he sort of advocates for higher taxes on himself, which is, I suppose, salutary. Um, but he, doesn't, he does not get taxed very much because his money is in investments and capital gains and things like that, and stocks and other assets, which are not taxed to the degree that just like a paycheck is. Question over here or a suggestion over here? Okay. Um, do you know how many, what percent of workers right now are in a union? Numbers, throw them out. Don't have to raise your hand. Five percent. Yeah, basically. This is down from where it used to be, um, which was like dozens of percents. Uh, unions are a mechanism for collective bargaining. They allow workers to negotiate collectively with their employer in a way that maximizes their power in a way that negotiating individually could not. Unions are a mechanism for reducing economic inequality. 
They have been hollowed out since the Reagan era in the 1980s, and union density is at an all-time low. Um, they've gone up a little bit during the Biden administration. There's some, some policy Biden has made that's like has revived unions a little bit, but there's still very low union density in the United States, especially compared to other countries. So can you say like, how exactly that economically affects how I can write it down? Unions? Yeah. Um, if so you like, are in a union, what's up? For like the reduction of unions. Unions are a way of raising wages and benefits, basically. When, pe when workers can negotiate collectively with their employer, right, as a block rather than individually, they have much more power, which allows them to negotiate contracts that include wage increases, uh, benefits, health insurance, retirement, pensions, things like that. The decline of unions and the rise of like independent contractors, right? So like the gig economy, Uber, DoorDash, this kind of stuff means that workers are much more, uh, they're doing a lot more contingent labor. They're doing a lot more labor without strong contracts. So wages are being depressed, benefits are cut and things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I would also, the last thing I have written down here is the financial system. So again, starting in the 1980s, no coincidence there, uh, the financial system became much more complicated. Anyone here seen The Big Short? Okay, some people. There's like a scene at the beginning of The Big Short, which is a movie about the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, there's a scene at the beginning where it like talks about the rise of banking, where prior to the 1970s and 80s, banking was like, your sort of like your like little community bank that would like give you a loan or give you a mortgage and it was like very sort of structured in your community and was not very complicated. Starting in the 1980s, banking becomes much more complicated. Financial instruments become a lot more complicated. You get, you know, the rise of mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations and the financial crisis because the financial system becomes extremely risky, extremely complicated, not regulated to the degree that it should be. This produces inequality if you have a lot of rich people whose money is primarily in this incredibly complicated financial system that makes them a lot of money, but people who are lower income cannot access the financial system to the same degree if so they don't get the, the quote unquote benefits of that financial system. So financialization is another story here. All right, how might we reduce inequality? I mean, before we talk about the details of this, but go ahead. Yes, providing what provisions? Like as far as like job guarantees as we're talking about or, or minor things like educational provisions and things like that. Things so let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So I have this sort of next section of like ways to reduce inequality grouped into three things. Sort of three subsections. There are others, this is just my schematic for it. I have like the neoliberal vision, and I'll define that. The sort of status quo vision of ways to reduce inequality. And then I have, we're gonna talk briefly about like spending, redistributive spending, and then we're gonna talk about redistributive taxation. So like the sort of way we talk about inequality right now and solving it, or at least we did until a couple years ago, was, I mean, partly there's a, there is a position that exists in the discourse, in the debate, that inequality is fine. Right? You could take the position, look, like people are richer because they're smarter and better at their jobs. This is a widely held position amongst a large sector of the commentariat. People who, people who talk about economics. But this is the Cato Institute, this is the Heritage Foundation, this is like conservative think tanks being like, no, people are rich because they're better at their jobs, because they, they produce gains for the rest of the economy. Right? This is trickle-down economics, you provide benefits to the richest, they create jobs, they invest in new businesses, they start startups, whatever. Maybe it's fine, right? Maybe, or it, even if it's not fine, maybe it's the interventions are worse, right? Like the problems are not that great, but the solutions are even worse because you distort the market, whatever. So the basic level, you could contest the premise that inequality is a problem. And I'll leave that to like the impact debating that you'll do for the rest of the camp. Let's say you sort of took the position that inequality was maybe a problem that we should ameliorate to some degree, but you didn't want to, you didn't want to do any of this, right? You didn't want to do any of this really complicated, big stuff. Uh, do you all know the phrase human capital? So classically capital, like C-A-P-I, T-A-L, refer to like the machines, factories. That's in like the sort of, the sort of classic economic theory is like capital is a machine or a factory or a tractor or whatever. Labor is the person, capital is like the physical stuff. Uh, human capital is the idea that you can 
make investments in yourself. You can go to school. We talked about education. You can take job training programs. You can read books. Like you can do these things that increase your skills, your knowledge, your marketability as a worker. You know, you get a master's degree. That is a credential that signals that you are higher skilled than someone who doesn't have a master's degree, etc. Um, so classically, student debt was a way to reduce inequality. And like, I think this sort of sounds funny at the moment. Like, there's a debate now about like canceling student debt and student debt being really problematic. And I basically agree with that. But there was a you know a while, decades, where student debt was a mechanism to reduce inequality. The idea being that student debt, you take out a loan, that allows you to afford college or afford a master's degree or a PhD or whatever, that then gives you a better job, right? That gives you the opportunity to make a higher paying job. You pay back that loan and you get the benefits of the higher paying job, right? So the student loan was you were sort of making an investment in yourself, in your own human capital, which would allow you to get a better job, upward mobility, and you could pay off that loan. Right, so student debt is like, has been envisioned as sort of this egalitarian thing. And there's aspects to which, to, to which that is true. Um, that's become a more of a problem recently when you know, the, the college, what people, what people call the wage premium, so like the benefit of going to college. So like if you have a person who only has a high school degree and a person that has a college degree, the wage premium is the amount more that the person with the college degree makes, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, that has declined, right? Like everybody's got a college degree now where it's like way more common to have a college degree. So going into debt to go to college does not pay off the degree that it used to. Uh, the cost of college is rising, so people are taking on more and more debt, which means it's harder to pay it off. Um, but you'll still see people talking about like college and human capital and student debt as a sort of egalitarian mechanism to reduce inequality. Um, you'll know the phrase learn to code. Some of you maybe, this is like, this is like not even as much big anymore, but like five years ago, it was like learn to code, right? If you're a coal miner who's been laid off because of the rise of renewable energy, just learn to code, get a tech job. Um, this is like, this is human capital still, but it's like not about education, not about college. It's like worker retraining and worker shifting industries and things like that. Um, so you have, you know, one of the sort of classic stories of inequality is deindustrialization. Do you all know what that means? Someone define that for me. Louder. Just shout it out. Deindustrialization refers to basically the decline of the sort of like classic factory job. Right? So if you were if you worked in Pittsburgh in nineteen six in the nineteen sixties, like my dad did, he worked in a steel mill in the summer. Right? Go into a big plant, <coughs> work in a steel mill. And there's still some of that. But a lot of those sort of basic manufacturing jobs have declined, especially in sort of like Pittsburgh, Rust Belt area. The reason it's called the Rust Belt, which is like Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, sort of Appalachia area. Um, it's called the Rust Belt because, uh, because of the story of deindustrialization, right? Like because factories have declined, because there are these places where you can't get a good job the way you used to. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of complex stories about, about the rise of caregiving and like nurses and home health aides being the job that, jobs that women in these areas now take. So before it was the man in the, in the family that was the breadwinner going to the factory job. Now it's women becoming nurses because those populations are aging. You can't get a factory job anymore, but in the major hospital that is the major employer now, you can get a nursing job. So you have the story of deindustrialization. What do you do with all the workers that have been laid off, right? What do you do with all the workers that used to work in the factory? Well, you learn to cook, right? You send them to Silicon Valley or you start a tech industry in Pittsburgh, whatever. Didn't really work. But that's like that's another sort of aspect of the human capital story, which is like we want to reduce inequality by training people and moving them into new industries. Questions so far? So I would group everything I just said about human capital and stuff like that into the sort of like neoliberal vision. Neoliberalism, I am using ref to refer to what? You all heard the phrase neoliberalism? What is it? There's a trick, there's a trick, this is a trick question because there's no, like nobody defines this the same way, but like, what do you think of when you think of neoliberalism? Uh, Hawaiian shirt and then other shirt. Sorry? You first. Unrestrained market capitalism is sort of the dominant mode of thought. Okay, capitalism, unrestrained markets, yep. Broadly speaking, it's just a conservative, a conservative political ideology which is basically 
Okay, conservative ideology. I agree. Anything else? Louder, sorry. Free market, deregulation, reduces the spending, reduction of spending. Yep, free markets. It's not quite as, I would argue it's not quite as simple as free markets. Um, you all heard the phrase laissez faire. This is like a push, like, you know, US history, laissez faire. This is like the, the golden age of capitalism, 1910s, whatever. Um, I would argue neoliberalism is a little, little bit different than sort of classic laissez faire capitalism in the sense that there actually is a fair amount of government intervention in neoliberalism, but it is government intervention to set up and establish and run markets. So the markets are still the goal. Um, and so the idea here is student debt is this because you have federal student debt programs, student loans, that are used to have people invest in their own human capital, go to college, and then succeed in the market economy. So there's some government intervention going on, but it's government intervention that is used to promote market solutions to the problem, such as human capital, which is the sort of like individual market mechanism where you invest in yourself and you earn more money, right? The definition of neoliberalism doesn't quite matter, but I'm grouping these all into things where it's like interventions that promote market solutions to inequality. I think human capital and student debt and things like that are sort of the, the way that this has been conceptualized in terms of reducing inequality. Do you think we're going to see things like answers to the cap that are like, we are actually more neoliberal More neoliberal than the K. What do you mean by that? Like the alternative, maybe like the alternative decreases productivity. Or, I mean, yeah, you could argue the alternative decreases yeah. productivity for sure. I'm thinking this. Come back to me if you want yeah, to talk I'll, about. I'll, I'll um, more come back to you. Cool. Um, so I would argue this stuff is like not really neoliberalism, right? The programs we're talking about here are, you know. That they are a more interventionist and less market-based way to reduce inequality than the sort of prevailing learn-to-code student debt vision. Maybe they aren't. There's going to be a neoliberal. There's going to be a cap K, right? Like, there's going to be an argument that they aren't. But I think for the moment we can sort of conceptualize these things as moving away from the current consensus on inequality. Let's talk about a basic income. Um, if I give a thousand dollars to everyone. With no taxes or anything else, if I just give $1,000 to everyone, is that redistributive? Does that reduce inequality? No. No. Interesting. Why not? Because everyone gets it. Everyone gets it. Is a dollar the same to everyone? No. Okay. What's different about a dollar to one person versus another? Cost. Huh? Cost of living. Cost of living. Okay. One person might. One person might need it more. Income, what does that mean? As far as like if you're rich and you're making three thousand dollars every month versus somebody who's making eight hundred dollars. Yeah. Three thousand dollars a month doesn't make you rich, but right. <laughs> but yes, point taken. Um, yeah, so a poor person needs that money more than a rich person. What is a poor person likely to do with that money? Save it. What is the word I'm looking? Is there a word that you think I'm looking for here? Didn't hear it. Have you all heard the phrase consumption in this context? Right? To consume a dollar means to spend it on a good or a service. Right? I go to the store, I buy food, that's consumption. I pay off my rent, that's probably that's consumption. Um, I pay my gas bill, I make repairs to my car, uh, I buy a new TV, that's all consumption. Someone said the other thing which is, like, what could you do with a dollar if you did not consume it? Invest. Invest or save. Those are sort of, sort of analogous in this, those are sort of the same thing in this context, right? Like, you could take the money, you could spend it, or you could put it in the bank. Are rich people more likely to consume or save? Save. save. Poor people more likely to consume, right? We all heard the phrase, <laughs> here's a big one, the marginal propensity to consume. Some nods, handshakes. What's the word marginal mean in this context? By units. So, yeah, basically. What's the marginal dollar in this context? 
just means like the next dollar, right? Like the marginal dollar is like, I have the amount of money I have. If I got a marginal dollar, that'd be like the next extra dollar. So the marginal propensity to consume is the likelihood that I will spend that extra dollar on, on consumption as opposed to saving. So it's like the marginal propensity to consume, the marginal propensity to save. If I'm a poor person, my marginal propensity to consume is high. I am likely to cons you know, spend that dollar on food, gas, whatever. The marginal propensity to consume is just how likely am I to spend that dollar on consumption? Right? How likely am I to spend it on a good or a service? So propensity is like how likely are you to do something. Marginal is that next dollar, the one more than you currently have. And consume is spending on goods and services. This is like kind of a big phrase, but you'll see it if you're reading, if you're reading stuff about this topic. You'll see these kinds of phrases. So let's loop back to my question. My question is, does a basic income of $1,000 to everyone, is that, does that reduce inequality? I argue it does. Because a dollar is not the same to everyone. It is true that everyone gets $1,000. But a dollar is not the same to everyone. Now, it doesn't technically shift the income distribution. Like, you could get technical with it. But to the extent that economic well-being, the, mar the benefit of a marginal dollar for economic well-being is higher for a poor person than a rich person, I would argue this reduces inequality. There is a debate about that. So don't take my word as gospel. But there is, there is a reason to believe that a UBI, a universal basic income, without any other characteristics, is progressive. It reduces inequality. Um, do you all know what single payer health insurance is? Mostly non. Someone define it for me. Um, a single payer for everybody's health insurance. The government. The government pays for everyone's health insurance, or the government is everyone's health insurance. Yep. If it's single payer, does it necessarily have to be the federal government? No, theoretically, no. You have one insurance company. Okay. Most people talk who talk about single-payer health insurance talk about it as the federal government. What's up? Why, why does someone need health insurance? Yeah, so when you go to the doctor, you get an MRI. What happens? Like, do you have to pay for that? You got to pay for that. You got to bill for that. How high is that bill? Too high. Really high. <laughs> health care in this country is very expensive. The mechanism we have to defray those costs is health insurance. How does health insurance work? Anyone know? Uh, someone hasn't talked yet. Hands. Go ahead. Basically, you pay. Oh, I meant back there, but it's okay. No, you're good. You're fine. Sorry. Go ahead. Basically, like you pay for your health insurance, and then like when you go, when you have a bill at like doctor, hospital, wherever it is. You pay for your, so yeah, two steps there, right? You pay for your health insurance. Does anyone know what that's called? The like, you make a monthly payment to your health insurance back there? No? Here? Premium. premium. Pay the premium. That's just a flat amount every month. Then when you go to the hospital or the doctor, they charge some amount and the health insurance pays some amount of that, not necessarily all of it. Sometimes it's all of it depending on the service, depending on health insurance plan, et cetera. Right? We could spend the next hour talking about health insurance. I'm going to move on for the moment. But the basic idea is that instead of this being a private market, instead of having health insurance companies like Cigna, United Healthcare, Aetna, you have the federal government doing it for everyone. Back there. All your medical needs or? It depends on the structure of the program. So. Yeah, there's, there's, there's proposals either way for single payer to like pay for just a certain amount um, or for just literally. And premium, which is the single payer system based on taxation, like for social security and pensions, right? Yeah, so I mean, you could have, you theoretically, you could have single payer with no premiums, but like the federal government could just pay. Um, but yeah, you'd probably have taxes that are the premiums. It would take the place of the premiums. Uh, okay, so I, I, you know, I would make a similar argument with single payer that it might be redistributive, might be a progressive program, even regardless of anything else about the program, if it pays for people's health care. That health care is expensive. Those costs are primarily borne by poor people rather than rich people because that additional dollar in cost is going to be felt more by poor people than rich people. 
All right, five more minutes, then we'll take a break. I want to hit the taxation section of this. Um, I will last, last thing I'll say is that the most recent experience that we had with redistributive spending was during COVID, right? This was the child tax credit, which was just a tax credit if you had kids. Uh, it reduced child poverty by an astounding amount, and then we ended it. <laughs> so child poverty went back up like three months ago. Uh, what? Child tax credit. I just you you got a, a chunk off your taxes if you had a kid. The other thing was the stimulus, right? Cash transfers. I'm saying this as cash transfers because that's like the word that people use in the literature for this. This is just money, right? You get a check. I got a check in the mail. It had Donald Trump's big signature on it. It was cool. Two thousand dollars. I bought new headphones. I, no, I legitimately did. Like I had, the AirPods I have in my bag are from that stimulus bill. I did. I, I consume. That's the thing, right? I my marginal propensity to consume was very high because I do not make a lot of money. So I bought, you know, I well, I bought headphones and I saved the rest, right? So like I did some of both. All right, that's the redistributive spending side of things. You can spend money if it helps poor people more than rich people. I would argue that is a redistributive program. However. There is a case to be made that fiscal redistribution has to involve the spending and the taxation. Maybe it's one or the other. We talked about this before. Like maybe it's just the taxes, maybe it's just the spending, but it could be both. So uh, let's talk about taxes for five minutes. Um, what I'm not going to do it here. What is a progressive tax? Yep. Taxes people that make higher income than lower income. You tax people more if they're richer. Yeah. More defined by what? Income. Income, uh, let me phrase that differently. Uh, in dollar amounts or in percents? Percents, right. So if you're a rich person, you pay a higher percentage of your income in taxes than if you're a poor person. That's a progressive tax. We have this right now, right? The United States has a progressive tax system. Uh, what's a flat tax? Y'all familiar with Herman Cain? Probably not, right? Herman Cain was a presidential candidate in 2012. He ran against Mitt Romney in the Republican primary. His big thing was 9% flat tax. It was 999, actually, because it was like 9% income tax, 9% sales tax, 9% something else. 9% um, flat tax. Uh, is a flat tax, uh, you know, progressive, regressive, or neutral? Neutral, you could argue it's regressive for the same reason, which is like the marginal dollar is more, is more important to a poor person than a rich person. So like 9% of someone's income, if you're a poor person, matters a lot to them, versus 9% if you're a rich person does not matter as much. So you could kind of go both ways on that. Uh, regressive taxation is just the opposite, right? Like if, you, if you're poor, you pay more in your taxes than if you're rich. That's regressive taxation. Um, do we have taxes in this country that are regressive? Yeah. What are they? Sales tax. Marginal propensity to consume is higher if you're poor. Sales tax is a consumption tax. Goods and services are taxed. If you're poor, you're spending more of your money as a percent on consumption. Consumption is taxed, meaning the sales tax is regressive. Make sense? All right. Uh, we talked about wealth and income. Uh, which do we have in this country right now? Do we have an income tax or do we have a wealth tax? Income, income tax. It's in the Constitution. It's one of the amendments. Very much one. Um, do we have wealth tax? No, we don't. Elizabeth Warren thinks we should. I also think we should. Uh, how would you tax wealth? Yearly income. Yearly income. That's an income tax. What assets someone has, right? You tax someone 10% of their assets. How do you know what assets someone has? Property. Property, that's a big one. For most people, that's gonna be what it is, right? But if you're gonna use a wealth tax to reduce inequality, you wanna hit the rich people. What is rich people's wealth in? Stocks. Stocks, Stocks. other stuff, homes, really expensive homes. Art is, the, is like one of them, right? Like how do you tax someone's Picasso? <laughs> You, take, you could just take it, right? We could just expropriate all the art. Just take it away. Right, look, look, you could just, you could go communist on them, which is fine. Um, 
But also, like, you know, it is like the point I'm making here is that like income is way easier to tax than wealth. Right? Income is like you have a reported income. If you have a job, your job reports your income to the federal government. Wealth is much squishier. Wealth is like how much is that Picasso worth? How much is the home worth? These are not objective criteria. You have to figure it out. You have to have a, a big administrative agency to tax wealth. But maybe it should be done. Um, we have progressive taxation in this country, right? In progressive income taxation. That's, that's a fact. Why do we still have inequality? I'm mostly, mostly a rhetorical question. We talked about that. But at the moment, our progressive income tax does not do very much to alter the income distribution. So you can look at like the income distribution before and after taxes. The after-tax income distribution is more egalitarian than the pre-tax income distribution, right? Because the progressive taxation is such that people who are richer are taxed more. It's just not that much. It's like two percentage points or something, right? It's like a small change in the income distribution. So a central feature of this topic might be fiscal redistribution by much more aggressive progressive taxation. Does that make sense to folks? Questions after an hour? Where do you stand in the camp that taxation isn't topical because you have to fiscally redistribute through or by specifically one of the programs and they don't inherently require tax? Um, well, if fiscal redistribution as a phrase is defined by taxes and transfers, which you could argue it is, then you could finance one of these programs with a tax, right? You tax wealth and you use that money to spend it on a basic income. So a basic income on its own does not necessarily require a tax, but if it is fiscal redistribution by a basic income, by at least a basic income, right? Also, by at least is a floor. So you can do more than one of these things. So fiscal redistribution is broader. By at least means one of these programs. So if progressive taxation is redistributive, then you can do progressive taxation and a basic income, and you still be toxic, right? Because at least means you have to do a basic income or one of the other ones, but you can also do other stuff that is fiscal redistribution, which might be taxes. Okay, back there, here, here. Um, you're talking about the use of part of the revolution. I don't think that's been something from what I on the NSDA website. It's not there. Oh, no, you're right. I didn't. I inserted that myself. All right. At least it's not there. The point stands, though. If fiscal redistribution there are very good cards that fiscal redistribution means taxes and transfers. Right? So you could finance one of these programs with taxes and transfers. There's a debate. Like, I agree that like, you, could, you could go for tea and be like, you don't get the tax. Given that most of the people who propose these programs propose progressive taxation along with them, or at least some people, like, it's going to be not the easiest job in the world. But yeah, sorry. A lot of previous topics have had by at least, so I just like literally, like it's on my computer here. It doesn't have at least. I just like wrote it down because every other topic has it. Anyway, so fiscal redistribution is the phrase that is going to tell you whether you can have taxes or not, in my opinion. But I'm not a T expert. Other questions? Yeah. Can you explain If you are a rich person, do you get taxed more or less than a poor person in this country? More. So progressive means as income rises, the percent of your income that you're being taxed goes up. Yep? Um, you were talking about the examples of like this tax redistribution that we got after 2020. You mentioned the child tax credit and one other thing. I sort of missed out on that. Could you just go over that again? The stimulus. stimulus. Check. Checks. I got $2,000 check in the mail. And the child tax credit was a tax rebate for having children. Yep. Right? Okay, good. Not, not, not birthing children, just having them. Like, so if you already had them, you got the child tax credit. So that child tax credit depending on how many kids you have? Yeah, I think it did. I think it had some limit, but it was like you get more if you have two versus one. I don't remember the details. Yep. Can't hear you. Sorry. Less than impact on what? To a point. Right? So, like, 11% of a rich person's money versus 10% of a poor person's money. That 10% is going to be to matter more to that poor person than the 11% of the rich person's money. But once you get up to like 90% tax rates or 90% marginal tax rates, like matters a lot. But yeah, so only to a point. All right, should we take a break? 10 minute break. 
Come back at 11.15, 10.15. The last two sections of this lecture, the next section are gonna be the other two sort of economic concepts I talked about, which are deficit spending and debt, what it means for the government to spend money, and then like, inflation and labor markets and stuff like that. So, okay, uh, do you all know what balancing a checkbook is? Yes, and you take home ec. I don't know if you have to do that in high school anymore, I did. Maybe second semester of your senior year. That's when I took it. Uh, okay. Uh, anyone, anyone? Balancing a checkbook, what do you what do you have to do? What does that mean? Not you. Someone else. Over here. Over here. Oh, uh, you try to make sure that your spending and your like saving or like how much money you bring in and how much money you take out is roughly the same and that you're not overspending or saving or like Yep, everyone agree? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well, can you it again? So, I don't, yeah, I'm getting it, don't worry. Um, if you're a person, you're like a, a household, or like me, the money I have to spend, or the money a household has to spend, or save, put in the bank, whatever, that would be out. So like spending, or putting it in the bank is out. In, like the money I make. Right, like I make some number of dollars per year. Can't really spend more than those number of dollars, right? Like the amount of money I spend is defined by how much money I can make. I don't, I can't create money out of thin air. One, one set of people that can, but we'll get there in a bit. Uh, right? So I have a little like, this is, this is greater than or equal to, right? So like I could make a bunch of money and not do anything with it. If I, I could put it under my mattress if I wanted to. Or I could just spend all of it. But I can't spend more than I make. I could go into debt. Right? I could take out a loan, but that's, that's in, right? Like the, the loan is money to me that I can then spend. Does that make sense to folks? Can't spend money you don't have. This is like the, 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 the most like home ec, like classical way of thinking about your, your budget. This is your budget, right? Like you only have so much to spend, the amount of money you have to spend is to find how much money you take in. Okay, uh, what if you're a government? How does the government get money? It's like, what's in for the federal government? Taxes. Yeah, you can just kind of shout stuff out. Uh, taxes. What's the other thing? Other main one? Uh, printing money, sort of. Uh, I was looking for bonds, debt. It's like, it's taxes and debt, right? Debt are bonds. And the government issues debt. What it's doing is making bonds available. A bond is like a document you can buy, buy a bond from the federal government, where I give the federal government $100, and the bond says the federal government owes me $100 plus interest. Maybe it's a 10-year bond, maybe it's a 50-year bond, whatever. These are long-term things, usually. Some of them are short-term. But this, there's, that's, uh, that amount of money, there's the $100 I give the government, and then there's some interest rate. But I'm giving the government $100, right? Like they now, the government now has $100 to spend on whatever it wants. So if, you're, if you want to think about the federal government this way, in equals out, the amount of money you could spend on a job guarantee or social security or whatever, that's out. You have to get that money either by raising taxes or by issuing debt. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, what is the safest investment asset in the world? Government bonds. government bonds. Sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, a treasury bond is the safest investment asset maybe in the history of the world. Second only to Dutch tulips. Uh, no one knows what that means. Um, US treasury bonds are backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. That's like the phrase we use, full faith and credit. Uh, you know, we have a giant military. We have trade agreements with everybody. Like, we have like 800 bases worldwide. We are, we are a global power. Our debt, our bonds are very safe to invest in. Theoretical. Sidebar, what's the debt ceiling? Okay. Yeah? Well, like, amount of debt the government can have, like, the limit to 
Right. So if we hit the debt ceiling, we default on our debt. Can't issue any more debt. We gotta pay it back. We can't pay it back because we don't have the money because we pay for we pay for things by issuing more debt. But we can't issue more debt. Uh, and then the global economy collapses. This is like a little bit of a stereotyped explanation, but it's also not that far from the truth. So every couple of years or so, we have to have a congressional debate over whether we should raise the debt ceiling. Uh, and then the debt ceiling disad, politics DA with the debt ceiling comes back every couple of years. So we issue debt. That's one of the main ways we finance things in the federal government. There are debates over whether we should prevent ourselves from issuing more debt. What's the argument that people make? Like, why is it good? Why would it be good for us to stop issuing more debt? What's the like conservative politician argument? Anyone know? Yes, we'll get to that. I'm looking for something slightly different. It's a little bit more caricatured. Yep. I mean, that's part of it. Um, really, what I'm looking for is the idea of like a debt. <laughs> we don't really have to get into like the origin of debt and like what a what a loan is and stuff. But a debt is future money. So if I, if the government issues debt, they issue a bond, I buy that bond for $100, and then there's interest on that. 10 years, it's a 10 year bond, say, 10 years from now, I might go to the government and say, I want that money back. Because a bond, that debt is a claim on future money. I can go back to the government and say, I want that money back. I want my $100 plus my interest. So there is a somewhat caricatured, but I understand where it comes from, argument that issuing more debt is a problem for the future, right? We are like doing something bad to future generations or future policymakers by issuing more debt because eventually that debt is gonna come due, right? Eventually, some, eventually we're gonna have to pay it back. So there's that sort of part of the debate that, that issuing debt is a way of getting money now and having to pay back money later. That might be a problem if you think about it in that way. Um, anyone know what the current debt to GDP ratio is? So how much debt the US government has issued relative to the entire size of the American economy? Billions? Can't hear you, sorry. Is that what you said, billions? So, no, <laughs> add, add a T. Yeah, so the current debt to GDP ratio is about 120%, meaning that we have issued debt in the amount that is 120% of the total value of the United States economy. Total value of the United States economy is about $100 trillion. So $120 trillion of debt issue. Is this a problem? Right? Yes, some yeses and some noes. I guess essentially in my case or um, element of thinking, it would be a problem because eventually the U.S. has to pay it back, but that would kind of down to like the citizens and how their own taxes or inflation will take out on them instead of kind of just instead of reissuing debt they can just quarterly pay it back so we could just pay we have to pay it back at some point right. why does the government have to pay it back at some point because of the different well because what i said right like right. eventually i'll come out and say i want my hundred dollars back right. can't they just issue more debt to pay that right like a whole bunch of people come to the government and says i want my hundred dollars back can I just issue more bonds to more people and get money from them and pay the people back? Yeah? I mean, it wouldn't be good for the federal government Why not? to a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi scheme, sort of. It's kind of like making your account that's already in the negatives even more negative. Sure, yep. Of, you know, At what point would we lose our credibility? I mean, we already issued more debt than the entire size of the American economy, right? <laughs> This is, this is a debate. There's no right answer to any of this, right? But like these, this is the debate over government debt. Yeah. I guess it's partially when it's like debt not only to like the citizens, but also to like other countries. Aha. Uh -huh. Like, and then you like, if you don't pay another country back, then you have kind of a bigger problem. Okay. So who buys American debt? Who buys treasury bills, treasury bonds? People. People. I could buy bonds. Who else? China. This is the big one, right? This is the, like, all of our debt is held by China. China. Um, it's the only Trump impression I can do. Um, so 
Is that is that a problem? Someone sort of gestured at that being a problem. Eventually, China will want it. its money back. Why does China buy our debt? China benefits from this, right? Like, they want their money to be safe. U.S. Treasury bonds are the safest investment in the world. Yeah, if we started a war with China, things might go sideways on the Treasury bills front. Maybe, maybe wouldn't. To be perfectly honest, like, we might we could fight over the fight over the Spratly Islands without too much happening to our T bills. Maybe. All right, so that's in, right? That's how the government gets money. What does it do with that money? Well, you might spend it. If we're debating about this topic, we're talking about spending money on a job guarantee, on social security, on a basic income. Uh, okay, there is a debate over whether it is good for the government to spend money, right? Can anyone define for me the fiscal multiplier? For every amount of money the government spends, how much does that then add to the economy? Precisely. For how much money the government spends, for every dollar the government spends, some amount of money gets created in the economy. Ideally, we want this to be greater than one. Right? For every dollar the government spends, the idea of a multiplier is that for every dollar the government spends, more than one dollar is created throughout the economy. Because if I pay somebody to build a bridge, that bridge carries commerce across that bridge in a way that it couldn't before. And the construction worker that built that bridge now has money to spend and goes to the store and buys stuff. The store owner now has money from that construction worker. That store owner can invest in something, can buy a new vending machine, whatever, right? There's a cascade effect where dollars coming into the economy from the government move throughout the economy in a multiplied way. You end up with more than $1 additional in economic value. That's the idea behind the multiplier. This is a classic debate over government stimulus, right? Should the government stimulate the economy with spending. We did this in COVID with the cash transfers and the child tax credit. We did it, when you hear stimulus bill, I guess that now means the, the COVID one, but really classically for the last 10 years or so, that meant post Great Recession, we passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which was a major stimulus bill passed by the Obama administration to re, sort of reignite the economy after the recession. And that was a lot of like building roads and bridges. And there were a lot of people that didn't like that. A lot of people that did. Um, why might it be bad for the federal government to build roads and bridges? It's kind of a bit up to them or in the kind of finish building. Sure, that you get like the bridge to nowhere, right? Like you start a program, you never finish it. It's just like a half built bridge for 20 years. Back there? Sorry? Cost money. Maybe we shouldn't be issuing more debt to build roads and bridges, right? Yep. By the federal government? Yes. Yeah, so maybe you have to move some money around. Maybe you can't spend more on something if you're spending on the other thing. We'll talk about that in a bit. Because we're going to problematize a lot of this stuff in a second. But there's one other thing I'm looking for that maybe you are not familiar with, which is the notion of crowd out, and in particular, private crowd out. So the classic debate over stimulus was like, if the government is spending money, the private sector won't. Right? If I'm building the road in the bridge or road of the bridge, there won't be private money flowing into infrastructure or whatever else. And maybe private money is better, right? Maybe the government, federal government is bogged down in bureaucracy and administrative costs and middlemen and stuff. But the private sector, now they are fast and efficient and lean. Maybe, maybe not. This was sort of a classic stimulus debate. It's going to be a little bit different on this topic, but similar debate over a job guarantee, right? Like, if the federal government's giving people jobs, those people might not take private sector jobs. So there's a debate over the proper amount of money the government should be putting into the economy. Same with the basic income, right? Like you, you know, you get money from the government, you don't get money from other sources if you don't want. So this, there's you know, debates over the multiplier, debates over crowding out private sector spending. These things are all sort of in the mix here. That's sort of some of the classic debates over government spending. But so we talked about, you know, government getting money by issuing debt or raising taxes. Talked about the government spending money by 
say, building roads and bridges, giving a job guarantee, giving people a basic income, whatever. Um, so I motivated that in greater than out or equal to out with like, if you're a person, you can't spend money you don't have. What is the one body in the United States that can spend money without getting it from somebody? The United States federal government. The United States federal government. Where does money come from? Can I hear you? Money comes from India. The United States borrows money from other countries? I think at times, but like, where does the where does the bill right like? Where does this come from? A printer. A printer. Who owns the printer? Okay, right. This is we're going to move into something now you probably heard about called modern monetary theory, and this is the critique of that. Right, so you often hear conservative politicians and some liberal politicians being like, look, if I can balance my budget in my home, the federal government should be able to too. If I can balance my checkbook, what can't the federal government? What's different about me versus the federal government? The federal government owns the money. They create the money. So if I tax a business, if I have an income tax or a corporate tax or whatever, I am taxing that business to take their money where did they get that money in the first place? Federal government. Had to come from somewhere. Didn't come from the business, didn't come from Apple. So, there is an, a school of thought of increasing prominence that argues that this entire way of thinking about government spending is wrong. I anticipate this being a relatively prominent argument on this topic because debates over redistribution, the, the, the tax and transfer idea is the idea that you should get money by taxing and you should spend that money on a basic income. But what if the government doesn't have to tax to get the money? Where could the money come from? Printing more money. How does the government print money? I mean, literally there's like a printing press in the United States Mint, right, where they like, they print the money. Uh, in reality, that's not actually what would happen. Really, it would just be uh, a computer. So like the Federal Reserve the Treasury Department can just like change the numbers in the computer. Right? They, 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 they just go to the banks, they loan money. They just go to a bank, they loan some money to. They go into the computer of the account of the money that the federal government is loaning. And just, in, just hit the up button. <laughs> right? Why not? Is there a problem with that? Push. Push? All right, we'll get there. That, that's the main object. So the argument that we should tax people to get money and then spend that money on a basic income or whatever else, there is a school of thought that argues that those two things, taxes and transfers, should not be conceptualized as one, right? We shouldn't think of them as one cause and the other. We don't take in money from taxes and then spend it on other things. Taxes and spending are distinct activities. They are not related to one another. When I tax, when I'm the federal government and I tax somebody, that money is destroyed. Goes to the argument. It's removed from the economy. Federal government then creates money by spending. It, it hits the up button in people's bank accounts, or, or it physically breaks bills. If you are a sovereign issuer of currency, anyone know what the phrase is? Like what, what is this that Bitcoin is not? Monetary sovereign, yes. What is this that Bitcoin is not? What can a monetary sovereign issue? Centralized. It is centralized. We have the Federal Reserve, that's a central bank. Yep. Bond. Yeah, but this isn't a bond. This is a dollar, ten dollars. This is currency. What type of currency? Yeah. Fiat currency. Y'all know what fiat means in debate, maybe? Yeah. Latin for let it be done, I think. 
Fiat currency is money that the government can establish via the power of being a monetary sovereign. It has the ability to issue money that is used by everyone in the United States as a, and the world as a medium of exchange. Do you know when this started? 1970s? No. Maybe you're thinking of the gold standard. Yeah? What's up? Okay. When the was founded, it started printing dollar bills? Well, something happened after we were founded before we started to print dollar bills. The establishment of Central Bank? Yes. What did we have before that? Gold standard, sort of. We had the Articles of Confederation. Do all, have you all learned about the Articles of Confederation in like, yeah? Yeah. So the original version of this did not have a single currency, right? There was not a United States dollar that says, e pluribus unum. Uh, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. We didn't have this as one system. What's up? Right. Each state had its own currency or could issue its own currency. This was kind of a nightmare. We now have a central bank and a treasury department that issues currency. Right? So, to back up to this idea, we're going to talk, I'm sure your lab, in lab, we'll talk a lot more about this idea of modern monetary theory. I have not covered even like the surface of some of the ideas, but the basic idea is that the government creates money, meaning that when the government taxes, and when the government taxes, it destroys money. Those two things are not, it's not a matter of taking in money to spend, it's a matter of increasing the amount of money in the economy by spending or decreasing it by taxing. So you'll notice here that the idea is not that the government shouldn't tax. It's simply that the way it spends is not by tax. The modern monetary theory folks, and you know, folks, this is like the core of much of the job guarantee debate. So like the job guarantee, many of the most fervent proponents are modern monetary theorists. So you'll read this from them a lot. It's, just, it's not necessarily where it comes from, but like those are the folks that are proposing that right now. Um, they argue that we should spend and we should tax, but we should view them as distinct activities. We should spend on socially productive public goods, bridge, bridges, roads, infrastructure, solar panels, wind farms, and we should tax, but the goal of taxation should not be the intake of money so that it can be spent, but instead simply managing the amount of money in the economy and taking it away from rich people if one if desired. Right? Like, taxation can be an independent tool to reduce inequality by taking money away from rich people, independent of any idea about money being spent. So this gets at something, I actually don't even think I've said this word yet. What do I say when I mean the deficit? The federal deficit. Yeah. We have more debt than we have money. Um, Not quite, but very close. Over here. You're good. Yeah, the, the federal government runs a deficit, meaning it's spending more than it's taking in by issuing debt, right? Like that's the way we deficit spend. But a deficit means there's more going out in spending than there is coming in in taxes. There are many people that think this is a problem, right? You hear complaints about the deficit, the deficit, the deficit, we have to balance the budget. During the Clinton administration, we ran a surplus. The government was taking more in in taxes than it was spending. So the deficit is not a permanent feature of the United States government, but many people think the deficit is a problem because we have to issue debt, we are gonna have to pay it back eventually, we're spending beyond our means. Modern monetary theorists don't think it's much of a problem because Federal government makes the money. It can spend the money at will. So if you're looking for one thing to read on this issue, the book called The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton, K-E-L-T-O-N, that outlines some of these ideas. That we should not be thinking about the federal government as a household that takes in money and spends money. We should be thinking of the government, we should be thinking of money as a public good, as a thing that the federal government has a monopoly on and can put to socially productive ends. This will become clearer as you debate some of these issues. I wanted to have that brief introduction. Yeah? 
Are you explaining the last bit? Yeah. So the classic view of the deficit is this household, like balanced budget idea, right? Like we're spending beyond our means because we are spending more money than we are taking in, and that's a problem. People that there are people that disagree with that, but said that is not the right way to think about the federal government. Right? The federal government is not a household. It, it does not need to take in money before it spends money. And when you think that it does, when you adopt the perspective of a household as applied to the federal government, you are artificially constraining what the federal government can do. You are limiting your vision of what economic policy can be devoted to because you are envisioning money as a private good it has to be first acquired from the private sector and then put to socially productive ends. Modern monetary theory says that money is not a private good, it is a public good that is established via a sovereign monetary you know, monopoly, and it can be put to public good independent of where it comes from in terms of taxes. Yes? Does that apply internationally multiple sources? It's complicated. Uh, they tend to not talk about that as much. <laughs> but yeah, other countries are also, right, this applies to other countries too. China is a sovereign, it's, it has monetary sovereignty too. So this is not just in the United States. This is like any country with a, with a central bank or treasury that issues money in that country. Yeah. Money Sorry, I can't hear you. If money is destroyed before new ones are created, then why is that, why is it a problem? Why is what a problem? Well, a deficit involves spending more money than you're destroying, right? Because there's more spending than there is taxes. So you're adding more money to the economy when you deficit spend than you are destroying in taxes. What's that? Can you make a video on envisioning money as a private good in this society? The argument made by these folks is that when you envision money as a private good, it has to be first acquired from the private sector via taxes and then spent. You are limiting what the federal government can do. You are saying, you are, you are imposing what's called austerity in these people's vision, right? Austerity is like, the government shouldn't spend very much. It should be minimal. You should not be investing widely in federal stimulus or spending. This is like post 2008, the Greek economy, for example, underwent austerity where spending was radically cut. So if you think that the only place money can come is from taxes on the private sector, you are neglecting the potential of the federal government to spend widely on socially productive goods at its discretion. And those socially productive goods might be beneficial, right? They might be roads, bridges, solar panels, whatever. Does that make sense? Okay, questions back there? Oh, no. Okay. So that's modern monetary theory, right? Just think of it like the conventional view is the household in equals out. There are people who contest that view and say we should not think of the government like a household. Cool? All right, um, I want to hit the last section here in the last little while. Inflation, what is it? All of you are dancing around it. You're all sort of right, but there's something else that is inflation that is not what you said. Uh, okay. Not quite. That might cause inflation, but what is inflation? Increase in what? Over here, over here, yeah? Costs. Costs, no. Here? The amount of money in your pocket. No. Something goes up under inflation. What goes up? Prices. prices. Ding, ding, ding. Inflation is rising prices. If I say the consumer price index, do you know what that means? What is it? Yep, how much people are spending on consumer goods. So the federal government, every month, okay, sends people out. They go to stores and they write down how much stuff costs. There is what we call a standard basket of goods. I mean, there's a standard set of goods that they measure. That's like some food, some energy, some other stuff. Maybe energy's not included. There's like one version that includes energy, one version that doesn't include energy, I think, so like gas prices. Um, you can measure it in many different ways. But inflation is prices rising, and we can measure that by going out into the economy and literally just looking on stores and seeing how much stuff costs. 
Um, is inflation good? Selectively. What do you mean? So is that inflation being good or bad? That's kind of it being good because you are being provided aid for that kind of. But if you you had to be provided aid to fix a problem, and the problem was inflation, right? Well, if you can afford it, is it really a problem? Maybe not. So okay, if you can afford it, maybe it's not a problem. Yep. Right. Okay. Your value of money goes down, you can't buy as much, your purchasing power goes down. Here. Um, inflation has to be growing. So if you have disparities rate, the value goes down, generally people have more money. Inflation, yeah. So that's the answer I would look for. Some amount of inflation is good. Typically, we're thinking, I don't know, 2%, maybe? 2% per year or so. Anyone know what inflation was during COVID, during like the height of COVID? Now, eight or nine percent. That was a problem. People couldn't afford stuff. Anyone know what inflation is right now? So that's a four? Yeah, it's about four percent. Four point one, something like that. Last I checked. So we have inflation at the moment. It's higher than we maybe would like. Maybe it's a problem because you can't afford things. Where does inflation come from? Why do we have it? How so? Well, how does the federal government cause inflation? Well, kind of like in the situation of like the um, US, Ukraine, and Russia, and kind of like basically sanctioning the US and 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 the US sectors like for example china our biggest biggest benefactor were to like just cut us out we would be in like a financial down like situ like situation as far as like nobody else would be able to fit into that category as well as sure yeah okay uh white shirt then green okay high demand and low amount of products yeah, back here. Louder. Printing more money. Why does that cause inflation? But does that cause prices to rise? Yeah. Sure. Okay, so I think we said it, uh, and I want to talk about the thing that you said, which is demand. Typically, inflation is conceptualized as a problem of demand. There's only so much stuff in the economy, and if people want too much of it, prices will go up because there are people are competing for a limited number of things, right? If ten people want to buy something, there's only five of those things. They're going to compete and potentially spend more, and prices will go up because demand goes up, right? If you have something that's really scarce, the price is very high, right? Like diamonds cost a lot because there's not that many of them. Whereas like paper is cheap because there's a lot of them, right? So during COVID, what were the factors that contributed? You think? to the 8% inflation. Oil. Oil, what do you mean by that? As far as gas prices, gas prices. Gas prices could have gone up at points they did. At one point, the price of oil turned negative during COVID. So, but there were times when the price of oil was very low. Yep. There's a lot of huge inflation rate. So maybe there are things like, as COVID, you're expiring, like, you don't have to spread COVID, the people who 
how she came into that habit. Not necessarily like acting as a woman, but like, where it's like, they're, 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 they're like, conception that people get like, to have a job as a job to do. It would lead her and lead to the reason that more people are out of a job and they need more attention. Why does more people out of job cause inflation? We'll get to we'll get the we'll get to employment and inflation in a bit. That's a major part of the story. Yep. Yep. Okay. The demand for like all the jobs that we used to have during COVID was still increasing. Like people still needed certain jobs to be done that just wasn't happening during COVID because of lockdown or whatever else. Why does that cause inflation? Demand for what? Okay. Other ideas? Over here. Potentially, yeah. So healthcare demand was probably high. There's other stuff that's not demand though, like other stuff that happened during COVID. Yeah. Pull out something you didn't quite say, but you basically said, which is shortages of products. So you don't remember the supply chain issues, right? Like there were just stuff piling up at Chinese ports because there were no ships to take them anywhere. There were ships lined up without transporting goods. But there were major supply chain related shortages of goods. That caused inflation, for sure. Like supply chains were a major factor in inflation in, in during COVID. Um, there was a, was in Philly, a major debate over whether the federal stimulus caused inflation. The stimulus bill, like the $2,000 everyone got. Why would that cause inflation? Or what would be the argument for why that would cause inflation? Why does printing money cause inflation? So these are two related but separate things and I wanna talk about this. So I do wanna push back on the typical view of like printing money equals inflation. The reason that adding more money produces inflation in the classical view is because it increases demand. So if you add more money to the economy, you increase what's called aggregate demand, meaning that you have more people with more money to spend on things. More spending and more demand pushes up prices of being equal. The same number of stuff, same amount of toilet paper, but more people with more money to buy it, so there's more demand for toilet paper, price goes up. Inflation. All right, so that's demand and inflation. Uh, you all heard the phrase overheating? Maybe. Anyone heard that phrase? You heard that phrase? You know what that means? Um, there's too many transactions going on in the economy. Too much demand. Overheating. The economy's too good. Too many people buying things. This is a major debate in like 2021, maybe 2022. Did we do too much stimulus? Did we overheat the economy and cause inflation? Maybe, maybe not, depends on your perspective. So let's talk about two other components of inflation. Well, a few others. How does the Federal Reserve play into this? I wanna do a little bit on interest rates and inflation because this is complicated and you should have at least some sense of it. Yep. Decreased interest rates should increase inflation because the price to borrow money inflation. Yes, there's a lot there, so let's let's talk through that. What's an interest rate? An interest rate is the price it takes to borrow money because when a bank loans you or an individual or whoever loans you money, the price then you have to pay extra to pay them back on that loan. Interest rates are the price of money. So. I could give you $10. You would give me $10 back. Nothing has changed. Fine, we could exchange $10. So there's no price of money in that regard. But you can buy money in another way. 
Like you could you could buy money by going to a cashier and be like, here's a ten dollar bill. Give me ten dollars in quarters. Okay, you bought ten dollars in quarters with a ten dollar bill. Fine. You can also buy money by taking out a loan. Taking out a loan is buying money. You are getting money now in exchange for paying that money back later. The price of that, the additional money you have to pay back later, is the interest rate. That's what that means. Does that make sense to folks? I give you a loan for $10, but I say 5% interest. So in a week, you pay me back $10 plus 50 cents. Whatever 5% of $10 is. Right? So $10 of 50 cents you pay back to me. So you got $10, but you had to spend an extra 50 cents to get that $10. Right? So this, this is how loans work across the economy. If you have a business and I want to buy, if I'm a farmer, I want to buy a new tractor. Usually you got to take out a loan because you can't afford that tractor in cash. It's really expensive. You take out a loan for the bank with some interest rate. You buy the tractor, you use it to grow your corn, whatever. You make money from the corn. You pay back the loan with interest. Right? Loans, interest rates, et cetera. The financial system is beneficial in that regard, right? Like banks play a socially important role by providing money now in exchange for money later. Okay. The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. They have what's called a dual mandate. And this is, this is like a key part of some of these things of the job guarantee is the role of the Federal Reserve. What's the dual mandate? What are the two things that the Fed, when I say Fed, I mean Federal Reserve, is tasked with doing over here? Maximizing employment and price stability. Ding, ding, ding. The Federal Reserve has two jobs, figure it out. They should maximize employment and they should control inflation. Price stability means inflation. Can these two things be done at the same time? Depends. How so? I guess like if you're if you're like an NOP person, you would probably say that you could probably do it or they could not. And you might be like, like don't say NOP is true, they probably trade off. Why do they trade off? This is what I'm about to draw called the Phillips curve. This is fake, but we will take it as given for the moment. Right? Unemployment and inflation. So the premise, the fundamental sort of background premise to this is that as unemployment goes up, inflation goes down. If more people are out of work and have money to spend, there's less demand in the economy. Right? As you reduce unemployment, as you increase employment, as you give people jobs, inflation goes up, theoretically. The, pro the reason is demand. Level have money to spend, demand goes up, you overheat the economy. Yep? If people are more employed, are they not also producing more products? Like, ding, ding, ding. So, yeah, we'll get to that. This is the classic piece. This is the, like, 1980s, Reagan, 70s, Paul Volcker, chair of the Fed. This is their view. They would know what the Nehru is. That's, this is a word. It's an acronym, really. Nehru. Stands for the natural non inflating rate of unemployment, I think. But the idea. That there is some point here, somewhere here, right? This is an area, and this is all fake, but you know, this is all theory. There is a point at which we should reduce unemployment, but not too far, because if we reduce employment even farther, we're going to push up inflation, and that's bad. Does that make sense? So the Nehru is the natural non-inflating, what's up? 
Non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Thank you. So this is some rate of unemployment where it's sort of balanced between inflation and unemployment. Does that make sense? So if you are a Fed chair, say you're Paul Volcker, Fed chair in the 70s, and you see inflation going up, like, oh crap, inflation is going up, like 10%, 15%, it's an oil shock, gas prices are off the charts. You see inflation going up. What might you be tempted to do? What can you do here to reduce inflation? Cut employment. Cut employment. You can increase unemployment. What's up? You can increase interest rates and you're increasing the value of money, which means even if there's more money, there's worth more, and that's the price is going down with more probably. Uh, not quite, but sort of. Um, so, so what can we do to increase unemployment? We can raise interest rates. So if you hear about a Volcker shock or like the Paul Volcker policies, those were a rapid rise in interest rates. Rising interest rates, all of being equal, reduces employment, increases unemployment, because when interest rates are high, businesses don't borrow money as much because it's very costly to borrow money. Individuals don't spend as much in credit card debt because that credit card debt is costly if interest rates are high, you have to pay back it, pay it back with a lot of interest. So interest rates being high means borrowing and spending goes down. That means businesses will lay people off. They will not borrow money to buy a new tractor and hire more people to run that tractor. They will let the tractor stay still and lay off the workers that would run the tractor. That would increase unemployment. That's what we did, right? That's, that's what happened in the 1970s. So the dual mandate here refers to the management of these two axes, unemployment and employment. Yep. Why would demand go down? So we're gonna we're gonna talk about these in a second. I want to say one thing about what we're doing right now, which is inflation. So interest rates following 2008 were very low. So one of the things the Fed, the monetary system, can do to stimulate the economy is reduce interest rates. Right? It makes money very easy to borrow. It means you're likely to spend with credit card debt because it's very cheap to pay off that debt. I mean, businesses will borrow money to invest and build build new factories, buy a new tractor. Low interest rates are an economic stimulus. They are monetary policy, right? So the Fed, Federal Reserve, does monetary policy by changing interest rates and controlling the money supply. So reducing interest rates, we did this after 2008 in an attempt to stimulate the economy. We were then in a period, maybe 10 years, of very low interest rates following the Great Recession in about 2010 to about 2020. That was a period of very low interest rates. One of the reasons that that period has been referred to as secular stagnation is because the economy was not actually doing that hot, right? The demand wasn't actually that high, but interest rates were really low. Like we were doing all we could to reduce interest rates and still wasn't kickstarting the economy enough. And we couldn't go any lower. Like interest rates, like theoretically they can be near negative for time, a period of time, I think, but like generally you don't have negative interest rates. Like zero is basically as low as you can go. We have since raised interest rates. Right? Maybe you all have seen news articles about this. Chair of the Fed, Jeremy Powell, Jerome Powell, Jay Powell, has raised interest rates over the last couple of years, a couple of percentage points. So we're moving back into a sort of more, quote unquote, normal interest rate period. This was done partly in response to COVID-related inflation. And so inflation's been high for the last couple of years. The Fed decided to raise interest rates to control demand in the economy. We did not quite get the like recession, like Paul Volcker raising interest rates caused a recession, to be clear, right? Like you, the Fed has at times decided in order to control inflation, we must cause a recession. Thankfully that did not happen, probably. It appears that we are in something of what people call a soft landing, meaning interest rates have risen 
but we have not yanked ourselves into a recession. We're sort of at a happy medium at the moment. Okay. So I want to talk about what a couple of folks have said over the last couple of minutes, which is let's say you reduce unemployment, you put everyone to work. You have a job guarantee, right? Everyone's got a job under a job guarantee. Does that cause inflation? Yes. Why? If you guarantee the job, then that means you can guarantee to make money. Yep. And that kind of that goes into like the reason why inflation might occur. Which is what? Which is like there's more opportunity to buy things okay. than you're consuming of. Yep. Why does that cause inflation? Because the more consumers you have, the more things are demanded. Okay. Higher demand. Yes. Conventionally, that would be the story. The MMT folks, the modern monetary theory folks, and, and in general, other sort of people that adopt a more sort of um, liberal or heterodox approach to federal economic policy say not necessarily. It is possible that increasing the amount of demand in the economy will not cause inflation. And it's what you said back there, which is if you're making more stuff, if you are putting people to work, producing goods, with available technology, if there are tractors that are sitting there not being used, and you can put those tractors to work, and there's no scarcity of goods, then the more demand for goods can be matched by the greater supply of goods. And you don't necessarily have prices rising. Right. Yeah? But under this theory, wouldn't the government then have to control every sector of the economy? Why? Because, like, obviously, if you have a federal job guarantee, and you're trying to make supply match the demand, then you have to have supply of every single possible good that can be produced. Yeah, I mean, you can have inflation in some sectors and not others. Um, but yeah, so the premise here is that there is an adequate supply of those goods to be produced. Right? The idea here is that there is what you might call slack in the economy or space for additional goods to be produced that would match or you know, meet that increased demand. So the folks that propose these ideas, the folks that are sort of behind the job guarantee idea, think that this is the case. They believe there is a lot of space in the economy. There is a lot of physical stuff and goods to be produced that are not being produced that could be if we were to put more money in the economy and hire more people, right? We would produce more factories, more tractors, more solar panels, more wind, turbines to meet the demand for those things. And we'd have more production, more GDP. We would not necessarily have inflation if demand was met by increased supply, and we wouldn't have people competing over scarce goods. Right? Does that make sense, folks? So the modern monetary theory perspective is that adding money to the economy does not inherently cause inflation. Printing money does not cause inflation in this perspective. Right, so like throw out everything you think about like Weimar Germany and like taking real barrels of money to buy bread. That is not going to happen according to this school of thought. Because inflation is driven by physical constraints in what we call the real economy. Inflation is driven by not enough stuff to meet demand. But if we could produce more stuff to meet demand, we would not have inflation. So whether or not a job guarantee or a basic income whatever else increases inflation in this perspective depends upon the state of the economy and whether it is possible to increase production and meet large, you know, large scale employment without over increasing demand without supply. Yes. Yeah. So you can't grow the economy infinitely forever. There's like not infinite oil or whatever. So yes. Like, there, there are biophysical constraints on economic growth, potentially. If you're a deep growth person, or an MMT person, there's overlap. But that does not mean that the job guarantee is inherently like If you can produce enough stuff to meet demand, you don't cause inflation. Does that make any sense to folks? So this is another scenario in which the like conventional printing money equals inflation view is being challenged. Many people are saying, no, printing money does not cause inflation as long as there is stuff for that money to go to. As long as there is available capacity in the real economy for money to buy and produce and sell and move through the economy. Does that make any sense? All right, we're getting restless here. I get it, it's been like two hours. Um, 
I have a couple other random things. I'm going to define two quick terms, and then we'll just do questions and chat. Does that make sense to folks? What is a counter-cyclical policy? Yes. Uh, it means that like, the government spends a lot of money when the economy is going through a recession. Hey folks, can we keep it down here? I just need your attention for another 15 minutes, then we're done with this marathon of a lecture. All right? It means the government spends like a lot of money when there's a recession or when one is high, and then spends and then like reduces spending and saves up money when the economy is doing well and unemployment is well. So we have this is a graph of employment over time. This is a business sector. Right? This is employment goes up and then down. We have recessions, we have boom period, we have bust periods. In this period of low employment, a counter cyclical policy would spend no money or a lot of money? A lot of money. During this period of high employment, a counter cyclical policy would spend some money, but not that much. Right? You have opposing cycles. I just wanted to find this because this is what people talk about when they talk about. Social insurance, jobs guarantee, maybe not the basic income depending on how it was designed. But the idea behind, for example, the jobs guarantee is that when you are laid off, you can get a federal job. If you're laid off from your private job at Apple or whatever, you'll go get a federal job building a bridge. So more during recessions, more money will be spent on the job guarantee to make up for the lost private employment. Right? Employment goes down, federal spending, federal wages on the job guarantee, right? The federal government paying people to work goes up because of people being laid off or fired taking those federal jobs, or those public jobs. Does that make sense? This is what is known as a, quote, automatic stabilizer. The idea behind an automatic stabilizer is that it is a pre existing policy, like a job guarantee, just implemented, uh, or unemployment insurance that when recessions happen or when downturns happen, people increase their uptake of these policies and they, those policies spend more money and they stabilize the economy, right? So a job guarantee would do this. It would, as people leave their private jobs, more and more of them take up the public job, the job building the roads and the bridges. And so the job guarantee increases its spending to stabilize the economy, it's an automatic stabilizer. Unemployment insurance is this as well, right? People get laid off, they take unemployment insurance. So the amount of money spent on unemployment insurance goes up when the economy is going down. And the idea is to give people money to spend on things and so they don't you know, fall in poverty. So that's the idea is that those programs kick in when people need them and they stabilize the economy. All right, is all the inflation stuff rattling around in your head? Is the two hours that we just did on this exhausting you? Questions? Thoughts, concerns, sweatshirt, and then here. Time frame of this business cycle is about a decade, maybe a little more than a decade. So, like, recession, there are recessions every 10 to 15 years. This is like in theory. Yeah. Um, so, you talked about this uh, secular stagnation. Yeah. Why did that not, why did that happen instead of just like a recession? How raise interest rates would be called a recession? Is that just because of the inequality or I'm not thinking? So, right, so there's two different questions you just asked. So, right now, the reason we did not experience the like Volcker shock recession is for a couple of reasons. One, because the Fed did not raise interest rates nearly as much as they did during that year, right? So, in the 1970s, we yanked up interest rates and just cratered in place. The current Fed has been raising interest rates much more slowly. That's one reason. They've sort of managed the interest rate increase. The secular stagnation thing is a slightly different one, and that was interest rates went, you know, we lowered interest rates following the 2008 recession. We invested money into the economy via the stimulus bill. There is a popular and I would say credible school of thought that the $800 billion, I think it was $800 billion, $700 billion maybe, Stimulus bill following the Great Recession was not big enough. So this is sort of an infamous story. 
Uh, Obama is debating the stimulus bill in, in like 2009. Uh, Larry Summers, chair of his Council of Economic Advisors, says this bill, as it's currently written, would spend more than a trillion dollars on the economy. That you would invest more than a trillion dollars in stuff, in stimulus. And we can't do that. Because a trillion dollars is a lot of money, and people will look at us and think that we're spending too much money. So we gotta get this number under a trillion. So it came down to about 800 billion. Probably should have been like double that. So if you look at graphs of the COVID-related recession and the Great Recession in 2008, they look different. So this is time, and this is you know GDP basically. So the Great Recession looks like this. GDP goes down or GDP growth goes down or whatever. And we have some recovery, we have the stimulus bill, but we still haven't caught back up, right? There's something like trillions of dollars. The economy would have been trillions of dollars higher if we had immediately jumped back up and recovered right after the recession. There was a prolonged decline and lack of recovery after the Great Recession from like 2010 to 2016. The COVID-related recession looked like this. There's, we, we basically just got back to where we were before, not entirely, but, but most of the way, much closer than after the Great Recession. Part of the reason for that is that COVID was by nature a very different thing, right? A virus is a different shock than a financial crisis and stuff like that, a class of Lehman Brothers. But also because we gave everyone $2,000. We didn't do that after the Great Recession. And so there is a good case to be made that the expansionary, the large and generous fiscal policy that was implemented during the COVID-related recession gave us this quick recovery relative to what we did, did or did not do following the Great Recession. Does that make sense to folks? This is an active debate. This is like what people are talking about in the economic context right now. How should we shape fiscal policy and monetary policy going forward given what we saw during COVID? Questions? Yes? Uh, probably something, it's like this, but like elongated. So like, because World War II, right? Like, probably something more, I mean, the Great, Re the Great Depression was like 10 years, right? So, or more. So this is GDP. Gross domestic product, total size of the economy. You know, growing, this is like Black Tuesday or whatever it was, 1929. Decline, probably is like that. And then it's like that, right? Because all of a sudden we built like thousands of fighter planes and a bunch of tanks and sent thousands of people abroad to war and employ all the women and have rose to labor and all that stuff, right? Like, this was a very different economic situation than, than we have right now. Can we assume that the federal government is going to adopt that kind of research and not maybe job that kind of research? The rich wouldn't want to do. Um, yeah, potentially. Um, yeah, I think the people that think about the jobs guarantee argue that the jobs that should be done are the jobs that are not being done now. So we should have a jobs guarantee to for caregiving, for example, the, the, the sort of like nurse shortage and the home health aid shortage is a good example of something where we need a lot of those people, we don't have enough of them right now, so we should give people jobs to do them. Um, building solar panels, building wind turbines, um, making public art, all of these things are things that if you are Warren Buffett, you don't feel the need to do. Thank you. So, um, as far as like implementing that sort of vision of the jobs guarantee into a policy, would it be more of like an investment into corporations to hire more people? Or like the federal government literally like creating like a corporation to produce that product? Um, it wouldn't be a corporation. Uh, the sec so like there are different ways to implement it. So one vision of it is like you are just employed by the federal government. You are a United States federal government employee. You go build a bridge. You're paid by the federal government. There is another possible version of this where it's like the federal government gives money to state and local governments. Mm -hmm. 
and tell them to hire people, or they give money to nonprofits and tell them to hire people. It depends on the policy side. Other questions? I'm sure you have them. I just threw a lot of information at you. Yeah? So why would the US dollar company be after Sweden before they're not? Well, it was still issued by the United States government. It was still a monopoly. It was still the one medium of exchange in the United States. There were not competing dollars. The gold standard was the idea that we needed to have enough gold in reserve to like back up the value of the dollar, um, which doesn't necessarily imply that it's not a fiat currency. It just implies we have to have a lot of gold. So this is going to decrease the value of the dollar? Why? Because the dollar is no longer backed by the United States. Correct, it's not. So does that mean the value of the said dollar is decreasing because of that? Uh, not necessarily. It does. It, it could go either way. It just means it's no longer tied to the value. So does that cause any economic effect as far as like international? Not really. You know, we went off the gold standard precisely because like we were you know, like we don't need this. There's much stuff during the Nixon administration about this, like that was on the end of it, I think. I don't know that, that much about the gold standard. My sense is that it was an archaic idea, right? It was like, we're, we're in a globalized economy now, the dollar has a market value, it has interest rates, it's traded on exchange markets for a certain value, you don't need the gold standard to back up that value. Anymore. Other questions? Yes. Either one, but generally, we implement policies like that with the intention that they are used more during recessions. So unemployment insurance is implemented and can be given out at any time, right? If you lose your job at any time, you can, if you get laid off, you can take up unemployment insurance based on certain conditions. But the idea behind that policy is that it becomes more active, more aggressive during periods of wide unemployment. So international like monetary exchanges and exchange rates are something I am extremely poorly situated to talk about because I don't know anything about them, I don't understand them. What I will say is that it, it affects exchange rates. So if the, va if the value of the dollar goes down, that means you have to spend more dollars to get one British pound. Right? So things become more expensive in Britain. If the value of the dollar. Right. And that affects that affects trade. Yeah. I may have a comment here. Please. So one way to think about interest rates, right? That's the return that you're getting for, for lending in a particular asset. Okay? If the dollar dollar is an asset. If the bonds that Chris described earlier, one way to think about those is they're just dollars that pay interest because they're dollar denominated. The US is not the only government that issues bonds. In fact, most governments issue bonds, but they offer different interest rates on those bonds. So one way that you might make it more attractive to loan money to, a, this is once again, assuming the conventional view, right? conventional view of, of borrowing on behalf of the government, let's say that the Bank of Japan issues a bond that is denominated in yen. They might offer an interest rate that is more attractive in order to attract somebody to you know, actually buy that asset. So if the Bank of Japan, oh, this is actually backwards because the Bank of Japan is currently setting extremely low interest rates, but let's say that they were worried about people buying their bonds, they might offer a higher interest rate. So like. Here, we'll, we'll issue this bond that pays 6% over 30 years, okay? That's the, that is the concept of like, you're then gonna draw some of those assets into Japanese government bonds, into yen, okay? So the different interest rates offered by different governments may affect who wants to buy the government bonds because of the difference in those interest rates. The strengths of the currencies that is related to that 
affects trade because as a currency has greater, if there is greater demand for a particular currency, so if the currency is worth more, that is, it is evaluated as particularly strong, and these currencies will float against one another. There's no, there's no ultimate convertibility for each other. You can just sell them, like you can trade currencies. There's all kinds of currency trading that goes on every day in very, very, very large monetary amounts, okay? As the dollar weakens, that benefits people who want to try and sell things in dollars, but hurts people who want to buy things in dollars. So if you're an exporter, you probably want a relatively weaker dollar rather than a stronger dollar. Because if I'm selling corn and it's being purchased by people across the world, I don't want it to be really difficult and expensive to buy my corn. If my corn is being sold in dollars and the dollar is worth a lot, that means it's really difficult to buy my corn. If the dollar isn't worth all that much in comparison to other currencies, that means that it's easier to buy my corn. It's the reverse for buying things that we need to import. So if I'm a farmer in Kansas and I want to buy a Samsung phone, okay, ultimately <laughs> the you know kind of relative strengths of the currencies between the US and Korea affect how cheap it is for me to get that phone. So that's that's my that's my attempt to explain that relationship. No, that's good. This is the part we're talking about, not in the context. What's that? Actually, <laughs> the interest rate is not the only way that the government can affect how much a currency is worth or is desired on the open market. There is also the risk of a given country's bonds. So U.S. federal treasury notes are typically considered risk-free, which is why every time we play. Uh, chicken with the debt ceiling and threatened to default on our bonds, everybody was really worried because everything would change. Some like US government bonds would no longer be risk free. But other countries don't have that. Brazil needs to offer a higher rate because they are considered a riskier asset for their bonds. Likewise, corporations that offer bonds have to offer higher rates than governments typically all the way down to junk bonds, which are really risky. So they have to offer really high rates. Let's do like one or two more questions, then we'll do some introductions to other stuff for like not a like bad thing. But last couple of questions, if anyone has them. Speak now and hold your peace. All right, you're economic experts now. Go for it. 